So we're going to reflect now on um, that reading from 1 Kings and we're going to be spending time uh, over the next uh, few weeks looking at these stories of the lives of Elijah and Elisha, uh, these prophets of God uh, from the time uh, of the kings of, of Israel and Judea. And in a season when perhaps it feels like uh, the vulnerabilities of life are highlighted to us. There's real value in looking back uh, to a time when life being vulnerable, life uh, being held by a thread was something that was far uh, far more at the forefront, far more a normal part of, of human experience uh, and seeing the lessons that God taught to those people who were so aware of their vulnerabilities and so aware of their need uh, for divine uh, help and uh, support. So it's probably helpful to start off with the context um, in which our reading comes. Uh, if you've got a Bible or you're reading the Bible on your on an Apple or on the computer or something, uh, if you b scroll up to the beginning of the chapter you'll see Elijah uh, is introduced from nowhere from uh, Gilead, so from across the Jordan, uh, and he's a prophet in the time of King Ahab. So the um, the nation of Israel, when D uh, King David and Solomon were, were in charge, of split into two, uh, Israel in the north, Judea in the south. And Ahab is the king of the northern kingdom uh, in Samaria. And um, he has done a sensible political move and he has married a Phoenician princess, uh, Jezebel. Uh, her name, she almost needs no introduction. Even if you've never read the Bible, you've probably heard the name Jezebel and all of the... Uh, sort of negative connotations uh, around her name. Uh, in the context of the Bible, Jezebel is is a woman from a foreign country who worships um, foreign gods, and most specifically a god called Baal. And Ahab has adopted her gods. He has built a temple to Baal in Samaria, and God is not best pleased, because Baal is this pagan god of rain. He's the god of life. When uh, when it rains, Baal is victorious. When there's drought, he has been defeated by death. So went the Phoenician belief. And so God, who is jealous for his worship from his chosen people, has sent Elijah to say, essentially, look, whilst you worship this false thing, whilst you think that this is what brings the rain, I'm not going to bring any rain. And so the rain stops. And fearing for his life, um, Elijah is led out into the wilderness over the Jordan uh, to a wadi in the, in the desert where ravens, these unclean birds, these spiritually unclean birds, uh, bring him food and where he drinks uh, from the stream. And our reading starts as the, the drought, the lack of rain, begins to take hold. And that is the stream that runs out first is important. So God is supplying the food through the ravens, but the stream, well, that's dried up because Baal has not been able to provide rain for the land. Uh, and so now God leads Elijah to a new source of food. Uh, and he leads him to this uh, Zarephath. It's a commercial capital uh, of the Phoenician Empire, a uh, centre of Baal worship. It's in the, the region from which Jezebel uh, has come. So Elijah is led into the, the home of the opposition, as it were. He won't lead him to a pace, to a person of independent means, but rather to a widow. A widow who is herself on the point of starvation, who has practically nothing to give him. In the past, she has trusted her life, we can presume, uh, to Baal for his provision. But now she's going to learn who the true Lord of life is. And she meets someone at the gates of her city who looks like a prophet of the God of Israel. She's willing to get him water. Uh, I think it's important to remember that it's a time of drought. There's not a huge amount of water. But he, a stranger, asks her for water and she is willing to go and get him some. She is kind, but she does not have food to give him. And he tells her not to fear. She'd been planning to let herself die. But to go and make him bread and then make some bread for themselves. Because the food will not run out. 
it will always be full until the Lord sends rain. And the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah is proven to be true. So we see here that God has withdrawn the rain to show that Baal can't provide rain. That God has provided food and that he's not been restricted. He's provided food through the means of this unclean carrion bird of prey. That he's provided food by a foreign Baal worshipping widow in a foreign city. God has not been bound in his provision of all to sustain their lives. And and now God's demonstration of his authority and his lordship over life uh, takes an even uh, greater turn. Elijah, we read, has been welcomed into the household as a guest, uh, not surprising given the, the culture of hospitality in which they lived and also the fact that he seems to be pretty much their source of food. It's his presence uh, that's led to this miraculous provision of food. And what happens next shows that although there's this food coming miraculously she hasn't quite yet the widow hasn't quite yet come to trust in god as the lord of life her son becomes incredibly ill until the point where he stops breathing the breath of life has left him and she blames elijah for his death it seems that aware of her own sinfulness she thinks what's happened is this man of god has come into her house and because he's there god has noticed and remembered her sinfulness and because of her sinfulness she's been punished by the death of her son for her the why of this suffering is her own sinfulness and interestingly elijah with her doesn't really engage with the why he chooses instead to go to the source of the answer, to the source of life. Elijah doesn't focus on the why. He focuses on the only place where a good answer can come. And so he takes the, boys, the boy in his arms. So I've always assumed that this is a fairly young child that he can carry to the, the room, probably like a sort of a shack on the roof of her house. And he goes up there and he lies the boys down and he cries out to God. He cries out to God for the boy's life, uh, throwing himself across the child's body. To me, this speaks of someone uh, who, who is not sort of set apart from the, the emotions of the moment. Uh, we can presume uh, that he's gotten to know the child, that he cares for this child. And so he cries out. He cries out to God in words that imply accusation. He's, this, is a diff, this is a family that are struggling because you've withheld the rain and now you're taking away her son. And God hears Elijah's cry and the breath of the life is returned to the child. And Elijah takes the child back to the mother alive and now she knows the truth of God. She knows that God is the Lord of life, not just able to sustain life, uh, but able to return it to those who are lost. Uh, and for, for some, this is a, an incredibly hard thing to read. Why, why this child? Why this boy? But that God is Lord of life is an important moment within the story of this family's life and the story of Elijah's ministry. Uh, the king of Israel would not listen to Elijah, but this uh, this poor foreign widow has heard and understood and believed. And this this word of God has, shows us that it is God who sustains life. It is God who meets the material needs of those who trust in him and of those who do not trust in him. We see that God is not bound by anything in the manner in which he chooses to meet those needs, unclean birds or uh, foreign pagans. We see also that God cares for those who are yet to trust him. You know, this Gentile family had done nothing to earn the miraculous gift of food, but it was an act of grace. In Luke chapter 4 verses 25 to 26 Jesus says I assure you that there were many widows in, El in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land 
Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. In this way, Jesus shows uh, the link between himself and Elijah. Elijah is a shadow which shows us what, you know, something of what the Messiah will look like. Jesus was sustained in the wilderness by his trust in God. Jesus, as we heard in our gospel reading, fed thousands with morsels of food. Jesus raised um, the widow's son uh, in Luke chapter 7 verse 14 with only a word of command. Jesus shared the good news of new life offered by grace to all of the peoples of earth. Jesus is the Lord of life. The lesson we learn from Elijah we can apply to ourselves. Whatever is to come over the next six months, we can trust in God and in hope. Our hope in him will not fail. We do not know the whys of why this widow, why was her life sustained, why her family's life sustained, why her son, why was he returned when so many others were not. We are clay in the hands of the potter, and it is not for us to know all the internal thinkings of the potter. But his hands do care for us, and in his hands we are ultimately safe. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that in your hands we are safe. That in your hands... Although there are things in this world, vulnerabilities of which we're aware, we know that we are kept for eternity. Lord, help us to trust in you for all the material things and all of the eternal things in our minds and our hearts and in our lives. Help us to rely on you as Elijah relied upon you. Amen. In a minute we're going to have our final song, King of Kings, uh, and if you want an opportunity to spend more time in worship, uh, just stay on the playlist and uh, there'll be more worship uh, songs coming up to help uh, lead you in that. Uh, but for now, our blessing. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Thank you as ever for joining with us today and I hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.